What's poppin' YouTube? What's poppin' YouTube? It's your boy Shay Rebel coming back at you with another reaction video. How everybody doing today? Hope everybody's good. Hope y'all doing in the best mood y'all can be in. Whatever that is, you know. Whatever the whatever the day you're you're catching this on. Always wish the best mood for everybody. Whatever mood you it's for Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, throughout the week. I hope your mood is set for that day. But with no further ado, we're gonna get into this reaction into this video. And we got a killer doesn't realize he's being recorded on CCTV. I don't think half the people that be doing these killings and stuff like that and the legal stuff and <laughs> be thinking that they be recorded by CCTV. Like it's so many cameras out there nowadays, like it's ridiculous. Like literally, it's ridiculous how many cameras are out there, like just out there. <laughs> Just catching people from from uh, traffic lights to uh, the stores to um, now doorbell alarms like the the, the name and the, the names for these for these cameras and where these places where they where they're at and the numbers and the amounts is is infinite you know it never stops because somebody's always getting one. Somebody's always adding one, or all, or they're always adding something or updating something. So we'll catch, we'll see how this guy got caught up and uh, didn't even know about it. Let's get into this. Oh yeah, before y'all, before we get into the video, please like, subscribe, and at the end of the video, comment, tell me your thoughts on on the video and uh, what you might have done differently if you was in this person's step, uh, if you was in this person's shoes, which I'm pretty sure nobody would be. <laughs> Let's get into it. Spring hot day on Friday, August the 28th of 2020. It was nearly midnight when 22-year-old Leslie Palacios and 25-year-old Eric Rangel Ibera pulled into the parking lot of the Longhorn Casino. Located in Whitney, an area once called East Las Vegas, the Longhorn Casino was built in 1989 and caters to visitors and locals alike seeking fun and gambling in a more low-key atmosphere. The two move inside and head to the Chuckwagon restaurant, passing by the slot machines and other gambling opportunities. She's a nursing student just months away from graduation, and he's a young man very interested in the date and what it might bring. The two settle in for a nice dinner and each have a number of... <laughs> so what does he do for a living? What does he like? <laughs> he just said he's interested in the date. Like, oh, okay, like, like, dang, like, you can't even tell what, the, he got a career? Like, damn, she, she the only one, she's the only one that's about to be making a bread relationship. <laughs> Alcoholic drinks with their meal. Really, it's nothing out of the ordinary. In fact, neither of them seem inebriated after their meal, walking back out, once again avoiding the slot machines as the locals often do. Leslie is carrying leftovers home in a bag and Eric seems to be familiar and a trusted companion. She, because of the pandemic regulations, is wearing her mask. Eric has apparently forgotten to put his back on, making it easy to recognize his face. The two walk out into the parking lot. Their dinner has taken about an hour and a half. It is now in the early hours of Saturday morning. The two have an animated but apparently friendly conversation as they return to Eric's truck. She walks around to the passenger side of the truck and Eric gets in the driver's side. Popping like we done after this like so we head back to my crib or what like what are we about to get into like <laughs> that's what a lot of the conversation was like like we had now like we going back to my place we dropping you off or what 
I mean, you, you never know. There ain't no sound in, on this day, so you never know. And this is at what, 157, so two o'clock, almost two o'clock in the morning. For a lot of folks, the date would end there. But in a town that runs around the clock, the night is still young. And, of course, the couple is too. They head off down the road to their next stop, Putter's Bar and Grill on East Charleston Boulevard in Las Vegas. The couple arrive around 2.15 a.m., about 20 minutes after leaving the Longhorn parking lot. The two have more drinks and leave some point later. No one working at the bar that evening could be sure exactly what time the couple left. Once again, while most folks may have called it an evening, the young couple kept their night on the town going. Their next stop would be one of the locations of the Bourbon Street Sports Bar. There, the two would be seen spending more time together, drinking beers and taking shots of tequila. Finally, after spending hours out and drinking, the two did finally call it a night and head back to Eric's home. The two get home just before sunrise as they're seen pulling into the street in front of the place Eric lived around 5.30 a.m. Leslie is showing the effects of heavy drinking, and now Eric has to help her from the car. She has a lot of trouble walking, and Eric helps her into the house. The two still seem to be getting along. Inside the house, Eric takes her up to his bedroom. The home is owned by Eric's father, Jose Ranhel, and his mother. His younger sister lives there as well. Jose has plans to take his wife on an event at their church that morning, but he's not fully up and active at this point. No one really sees the couple come in. And then, something goes terribly wrong as the two end up in bed. Terribly, irrevocably, and fatally wrong. <laughs> Before we begin, we would like to send our deepest sympathies to the family and loved ones of Leslie Palacios, a young woman taken from us just as her life was blossoming. By Saturday afternoon, Leslie's family has become worried because she never came home from her date. Her mother, Araceli Palacio, and her sister, Nayeli Palacio, contacted the Las Vegas Metro Police Department and told them that Leslie had not come home from her date the night before. They said they had been trying all morning to call her and to text her, but there had been no responses. The last communication her sister received from Leslie had been a text from her phone number that simply said, I need to tell you some sh Araceli's reply of what happened was never answered. Then, Metro Police Department did some... Wow. And that could mean, like, that could mean, that could mean, like, multiple different things. Like, you never know what that could mean. It could mean something good. It also could mean something bad. But at the same time, it's just like, she stayed out with him for that long to, from, like, I mean, I guess they, I guess they met up, met up around like, <clears throat> like one in the morning or something like that. So they, and they, their first stop was around like one, one twenty, one thirty in the morning. Ended around two, and they kept on bouncing around to different spots. And they morning ended around like six, seven in the morning. Like, and throughout the whole time, it looked like everything was fine. Like nothing seemed off. Like nothing seemed like you know. Everything seemed fine, like to be honest, like crazy enough. But that's why nowadays, and even at this time, women, women, especially when y'all have iPhones, women be hitting up their girls, be like turn on their, they know the, uh, they like location and stuff like that. So just in case anything like this like goes wrong or anything like this like happens, like you, you always can be like on, you know, always be one step ahead of whoever it is you that might be even plot that might be plotting on you. Even if they're not plotting on you, like, you know, just always be one step ahead and be safe for yourself. You know, leave. sometimes you got to leave your, your safety up to technology. Sometimes you can't always be left up to somebody else, you know. One thing that police departments and law enforcement agencies across the country are quickly phasing out, they told them they needed to wait 24 hours before declaring her missing. 
In the past, the 24-hour waiting period was a rule of thumb or a guideline widely followed in the days before people carried cell phones or even had access to landline phones in every home. The one-day wait rule would give people a chance to wander back home after either finding roadside assistance, getting over an argument, or whatever that had taken them away from their home in the first place. Over time, the law enforcement community realized that the policy wasted vital hours in the search for actual missing persons, oftentimes with tragic results. As cell phone use grew and ease of contact and communications grew with it, it was the final straw for the poorly conceived policy and almost all departments now have a policy of investigation at the first report of a missing person. The idea that a person's family and friends would be the best to judge whether the person was actually missing won out over the manpower and budgetary concerns of the old policy. And yet, in this case, the Palacios family were asked to wait, and so they did, but not without trying to get in touch with Jose Ranjal by phone to check and see if he knew what the couple had gotten into. He never answered. The family then tried to call Eric's sister, but again, no answer. They even went down to Ranjal's home, but no one came to the door to answer it. They returned to the home an hour later, they said, and saw Eric's mom and sister loading some furniture into the back of a truck, but were unable to talk to them. The following day, with Leslie still missing and not replying to any communication attempts, they again contacted the police this time opening a missing person's case. They informed investigators on what they knew about who she had gone out with and what little they knew of their plans. Somewhere in the department, at another desk on August the 31st, members of the Metro Police Department were taking another missing persons report, this time for two men, a father and son, Jose Rangel and his son Eric Rangel Ibarra. It took until September the 1st for the officers with the Missing Persons Department to match the two cases, especially with the Palacios family naming Eric as Leslie's date. A BOLO or Be on the Lookout report went out. Officers headed to the homes of the Palacios family and the Ranghels, homes that were only a few blocks apart. The families had known each other for almost 15 years. Canvassing the area around the Ranghel home on Tipper Avenue, officers were able to identify a security camera that would have looked down on the family's property. They were quickly able to obtain access to the videos taken by that camera and rewound the video until they had unmistakable proof that something terrible had happened. What had been two missing persons cases quickly became one case for the Metro Police Department's Homicide Division. Investigators say video from the morning of August 29th shows 25-year-old Eric Rangel Ibarra helping 22-year-old Leslie Palacio, seen here alive, get out of his truck and into the house. An hour later, in video we blurred due to its graphic nature, the same camera catches Rangel Ibarra and another man, who prosecutors believe is his father, 46-year-old Jose Rangel, dragging a lifeless body from the home and into that same truck. Oh, wow. Minutes after, the truck drives off, leaving Rangel hosing off the walkway. And now, both Jose and Eric are missing. Their family left behind have no idea where they are, but officers now know that the Ranhel home is a crime scene. Warrants were obtained. Officers and forensic team members go through the home to find what would be described later as an attempt to clean up the place, perhaps unwittingly attempting to remove the evidence of a murder. As alert bulletins went out immediately with descriptions of the two men and of Rangel's pickup truck, including the license plate number, investigators went room to room in the small two-story home documenting the evidence still there. Las Vegas Metro Police Detective Mitchell Dorsch would later tell a grand jury that there were numerous pieces of evidence found at the scene of the Rangel's home. On the living room couch, a pair of blue latex gloves were found. Another set and numerous cleaning supplies were also found in the adjacent dining room area. Inside a mop bucket in the kitchen was a stained cleaning cloth, and the mop head showed signs of a dark substance as well. 
Upstairs, the scene of Eric's bedroom looked like it had been torn apart bit by bit and items had been moved around. Suspiciously, the fitted sheet had been removed from the mattress and was nowhere to be found. There were a couple of dark stains on the mattress as well that caught the attention of investigators. Inside the room, they also found a preferred customer card which would prove to be registered to Eric. Nearby, a shirt on a hanger, one of Eric's. It also had blood drops on it. Eric's wallet was found in the room. No money, but all of Eric's IDs were still there. Investigators also checked in the bathroom and found two blood spatters on the floor and took samples of them. The source of the spatters is still undetermined. As investigators combed through... That's crazy. That's crazy. So whatever they did, they basically never cleaned up. Never cleaned up. And just... It's like they basically it sounded like he just found like him sound found him a victim. Went out, got drunk, got messed up, took him back to his crib. Bruh, this is this is insane. Just had their way basically to do The Ranghell home, arrest warrants were sworn out on Eric and Jose. Local media outlets flashed up the announcements, alerting the public to be on the lookout for the two men, showing photos of both and including images of how they would look in surgical masks that nearly everyone was wearing at the time during that phase of the pandemic. The warnings came out too late to catch Eric and Jose, though. The notices did catch the attention of a friend of Eric's, though, and he had some very important information for local investigators. The man explained that he had known Eric for about five or six years, and the last time he had seen him in person was weeks before. Eric had come into a restaurant where the man was eating, and Eric was obviously very intoxicated. He sat down and asked the man if they were friends, and would he do him a favor in the future if Eric asked him to. The man said it was an awkward request, and that he had humored Eric, obviously because he was drunk. Eric left, and the man didn't think about it again, until the morning of Saturday the 29th. The man said he got a call from a telephone number he did not recognize. When he answered it, it was Eric, and Eric immediately reminded him that he promised he would do him a favor. He was calling in that favor. Eric said that he needed to bring him some gasoline, and he couldn't find any himself because he didn't want to be seen anywhere on camera. The man asked him why, and Eric told him, according to his testimony before a grand jury, that Eric claimed he was in Utah, some 125 miles north of Las Vegas. The request was crazy and it didn't make sense. Why did he need someone to bring him gas from so far away? And why was he using a different phone than his usual one? Eric, oh, wow. who was obviously stressed out, told him he was on a burner phone. And then he said the words that would turn the missing person cases and the strange occurrences into the worst possible situation. Because I killed a bitch, Eric told him. He then repeated it when his friend said that he didn't believe him. I'm for real. I killed a bitch. I'm serious. She's dead in the back seat of my truck right now. The man wanted nothing to do with the situation, and he told Eric that he had to go pick up his daughter that morning and couldn't help. He then said he told Eric that he'd screwed up by telling him what he had told him. Eric immediately hung up the call. The man went to the police when he saw the reports on the local news. Eric, meanwhile, headed back to Las Vegas, apparently. He met back up with his dad, and the two took off for parts unknown. They told no one where they were headed, told no one what had happened, and seemed to leave no trail behind them. No debit card transactions, no cell phone pings for their phones, no witnesses calling in to say they had been spotted. They vanished like a pair of ghosts, leaving Jose's wife and daughters behind without any explanation. It would be September the 9th before Leslie's body would be found. Members of the Moapa Tribal Police, Red Rock Search and Rescue, and investigators from the Las Vegas Metro Police Department discovered Leslie's remains in the Moapa Valley near the Valley of Fire State Park, roughly 60 miles from Las Vegas. 
The location was a few miles east of Interstate 15 on the Valley of Fire Highway, about 2,500 feet down a dirt road. Her remains were hidden behind a bush located in a wash. Investigators would later tell a grand jury that the body had suffered terribly from the heat, turning black over the intervening days. In addition, it had suffered considerable damage from insects. Identification was initially made by matching the clothes that Leslie was seen wearing in the date-night videos, a striped top and blue jeans, to what was found on or near the corpse. Leslie's body was found without pants, and her underwear had not been put on correctly. According to the detective who was part of the recovery team and who had attended the autopsy, her thong-style underwear had been put back on her as if the thong portion had been the waistband on the underwear. Her pants were found nearby in another bush. The body was taken to the state laboratory for testing and an autopsy to confirm the cause of death. Due to the ravages of the desert and the high temperatures, coroners were unable to determine the exact cause of death. The day after her body was found, Leslie's family, friends, and members of the community gathered for a memorial service for the young woman. It was a heartbreaking end to any hopes that she may have been found alive. That's sad. That's sad as hell. Go out, think you're about to have a simple date have some drinks, have a good time, you don't even make it home, and then your family out there looking for you and calling, and they get told they gotta wait 24 hours, that, I feel like that rules some bullshit, like, like they said, it, like, it gives up too much time, it gives up too much time, like, because somebody's looking for somebody, like, within an hour or two hours, like, and they just seen that person, and so they know something's off, like, Nobody wants to wait no 24 hours to call somebody or call a, a place to let them know somebody's missing and, 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 and at the end of the day know that they're not going to even do their jobs fully 100%. They might just ask you a bunch of questions and stuff like that, but other than that, it's not going to necessarily give you the answers that you like. It's not going to give you the answers that you're looking for or some shit. Like, it's just not. But, yeah, this is crazy. This is very fucked up. Like, they... Basically, it sounds like, I don't, I don't know if they raped her or what, like, I don't, I don't know, but, man, it's ridiculous. As for Eric and Jose, they were gone, effectively disappearing. There were no reports about them being seen anywhere. And then, on January 19th of 2021, just over three months later, Jose Rangel turned himself in at the U.S.-Mexico border crossing. Officials from the San Isidro Border Patrol Station near San Diego, California, arrested him immediately and contacted the authorities in Las Vegas. Jose would waive his Miranda rights and would waive any extradition fight. He wanted to come home to his family. All he could say about Eric was the two had split up in Mexico and he hadn't heard from him in months. Investigators said that Jose was cooperative from the very beginning of their interviews, but originally gave a story that was watered down to lessen his involvement in the case. Once confronted by the security camera videos, he recanted his original story and opened up more to the officers. Jose said that he had been up early that morning and had been working in the home's garage. He had plans to take his wife to a church event in a couple of hours and was taking care of some things when he heard Eric and Leslie enter the house and stumble up the stairs. He said that a half an hour later, Eric came down the stairs shirtless, dragging Leslie's body behind him on a bed sheet. Jose said Eric told him that she had overdosed and died. Eric then completely lost his senses and started telling his father that they had to do something with the body. Jose said he immediately helped Eric get the body out of the house so that his wife and daughters would not come downstairs and be involved. He would continue by saying that when he looked at Leslie, he could see no obvious injuries. There was no blood or vomit on her, and she was only partially dressed with no pants and her panties pulled up awkwardly around the waist. He helped Eric put her into the car and immediately grabbed the water hose and started spraying off the gravel outside as his son drove away with the body. 
He told investigators that he had not consciously been attempting to destroy evidence then, but was just stunned and trying to do something. He said he thought Eric was heading to Utah with the intention of destroying the body. Distraught, Jose went to his other daughter's nearby home to speak with her. Shortly after he arrived, though, he said Eric turned up at that house as well. Jose had not expected to see Eric back that day, and Eric began acting crazy, shouting that he was going to kill himself or Jose, and that some people might be coming to kill the family. He said he chose to flee with his son, and the two went back home, gathered all the cash they could, and headed to California, and then crossed the border into Mexico by that evening. During the drive, Eric refused to talk about what had happened, except that Leslie had overdosed on narcotics and he had way too much to drink that night. In the end, Jose would strike a plea deal and pled guilty to destroying evidence and an accessory to commit murder, both misdemeanor charges. He spent 205 days in the Clark County Detention Center before coming to trial. He would be sentenced to a total of two years in jail for what he had done. The 205 days already served would be counted against that sentence as time served. The charges and light sentencing he received would be decried throughout the community and even within the district attorney's office. Chief Deputy District Attorney... Well, for real, like, come on. Like, come on, especially because you had, you had a hand in it. And you're the father. Like, you're the father and you're sitting there helping your son create, commit murder. Like, what kind of example, what kind of example did you set for your son? Like, did you even raise him right? Because it don't look like you raised him right. The fact that he's able to do that and then come to your, come to your dad and be like, help me dispose of this, to the like, boy, please. I'm not helping nobody expose it, nothing. You're going to just get caught, plain and simple. Don't even tell me. I don't even want to know. Dead ass. Attorney John Giordani would tell members of the press that the Nevada legislature needs to do something about this because dumping a young girl's body and treating her like a piece of trash should not be treated as a misdemeanor. And assisting a murderer after he commits such an egregious crime should not be treated as a misdemeanor. Leslie's family would also speak to the press about Jose's sentencing. Jose would only serve an additional eight months in jail before being released. During his time in jail, he had... Oh my lord, are you serious? Eight months? Are you serious? Eight months? Bruh. I would just threw the book out. Whether you even, even if you didn't commit the murder, the fact that you were okay with what he was doing at the end of the day and you knew what he was doing, you, you gotta get the book too. I don't care. You can get the book too. Book and his fucking hands. I don't give a fuck. Fuck that. And taking a number of courses mandated by the state that allows offenders to reduce their jail times. His release stirred up bad feelings within the community. He was now a free man. 
His son, Eric, was still out there, walking free and unpunished for what had happened on that fateful night and the next morning. He has been the subject of two nationally broadcast television specials, but no solid evidence has turned up. Reports that he has been seen both in Chihuahua State and Durango State in Mexico, but so far he has managed to avoid the authorities there. Leslie's family continued to make pleas to the community for any information that would put this case to rest and bring Eric to stand before a judge. We always think about her all the time, like, there's not a day, you know, that goes by that we don't know. Everything reminds us, bring yourself in, because there's no way of hiding out anymore. You can't hide forever and just, you know, pay for what you did, because we're, never, we're not going to stop until we get justice. He is still a very wanted man, and if you have any information as to his whereabouts, please contact the Nevada State Police by calling 755-684-2644. Nah, shit, fucking, oh, this shit ain't over. Shit get in contact with, with, those, with those people that his parents, the girl that lost their life. We may never know the real story of what happened to Leslie Palacio when she entered the home of the Rangel family. Was it an overdose that took her life, or did Eric somehow kill her as he told his friend? We can only hope that one day, justice will catch up to him. That's crazy. If you found this case compelling, don't forget to... That's insane. That's crazy. You tell, you tell your friend that you killed somebody, and then you tell the cops that she overdosed. <laughs> see, this, see with the whole lying thing? That's crazy. And that's the thing you gotta remember. Whenever you do a crime, they gonna look at everything. They gonna look at. They gonna. They gonna look at everything. They gonna look at. From the time that you woke up, the first thing that you did, then to the next thing, they gonna look at your life like it's a vlog, like dead ass, like it's like it's on camera. That's what they gonna literally do. And our um, R.I.P. to this to this young lady, bro. Like she did not deserve that. Like. And it's crazy because she was like young, still young, about to do amazing things, great things, you know, great, great things for sure. And then had to deal with, had to go through this, run, running through this type of shit in life. Like, sad. It's very sad. On, 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 on all ends. It's very sad. But, you know, I hope y'all like this. I hope y'all like this video. Tell me y'all thoughts on it. Um, like how, how, like what made what made this stick out to you? What were certain things that you noticed that uh, that I that I maybe didn't notice at all? Um, comment, like, and subscribe to the boys page. I all appreciate all the all, all of you all that are subscribing and uh, dropping a like and a comment. I'm on that road to to a hundred. And then after that, 200, 300, 400, 500, I'm just trying to keep on going up. I'm trying to keep on bringing out great content. I'll catch you on the next one.